Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit for all that they have done for us, not only uh, back 2,000 years ago upon the cross of our Lord and also his resurrection, but each and every day as they provide for us and give us our every need that we have uh, each and every day. And as we know, we, God has given us the greatest gift of all time, that is our salvation person and work of Jesus Christ and also that everlasting life that we richly enjoy because of our faith in him demonstrated through the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we've been celebrating that over the last couple of months as we've been studying the Gospel of Luke in regard to the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is the greatest thing we have to be thankful for and that is the new spiritual life that we all receive and anyone receives who believes upon him. But it doesn't just stop there because God provides us those logistical grace blessings each and every day. And he gives us the air to breathe. He keeps our heart beating. He keeps our brain intact. And he keeps our body in motion every day. Until that day when he wants to stop from its motion and remove our spirit and soul and bring it to the eternal state with a new resurrection body uh, to join with our spirit and soul in the eternal state. But God provides for us our every need here on planet Earth. As I said, the air to breathe, our heart beating, but also the food and the sustenance and all the material things that we need to go forward in His will and plan each and every day. And again, another important part of that is the Word of God, Bible doctrine, that we have to be resonant within our soul so that we have power and strength to overcome the spiritual life that God has now entered us into. And so again, we give thanks to God for all that He has done and performed and provided and all that He will do for us in the eternal state. But as we come together on this uh, third Thursday of the month of November each and every year, as now it is tradition within the United States of America, we celebrate that Thanksgiving that goes all the way back to those first individuals who came from England, traversed the sea, and ultimately landed, as we know, there in Plymouth, Massachusetts, just a few uh, miles from where we are now, and landed in that place and began a colony there that then erupted into what we know as today as the United States of America. And so what I traditionally do is give you a little bit of history, because again, we don't get much history out in the world anymore. A little bit of history once again. I'll just read through uh, the normal history lesson that I give you about that. But then we're just going to get into a lot of praise this evening in regard to the verses and scriptures that we find. And again, just a few that I've picked for this evening. But there are many, many, many many scriptures that have the word thanks or thanksgiving in them, both in the old and the new. And again, I probably should have done some numbers on that and added it all up for you to give you a little bit of impact there. But as we see giving found within the old and the new Testament, as many times that it is, we have to understand the very importance that it has spiritual walk in our spiritual life and how much we really should be giving thanks each and every day to our God and to our Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. But again, we give thanks for the nation that he has provided for us. We live in a great prosperous nation with great freedom and privacy and protection, rule of law, as we know, within the United States of America. And we continue to have the great freedoms of assembly, of worship, of speech within our nation where we can freely proclaim our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and deliver that gospel message to a lost and dying world within our country and throughout the world. God has blessed us with the nation like never before. The freedoms and prosperity that we have are fantastic. And it's interesting, as you think about the early church, they were under the thumb of the Roman Empire with all the false gods and the false religion and the worship of the Roman Emperor. And they were persecuted to the hilt. And yet the gospel message rang true and rang free. Because, in, again, in the mind of their soul, they were free to witness and evangelize and give the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were more concerned about doing that than what their own lives would entail, their own freedom, prosperity, and even their own lives. And the gospel, again, went throughout the entire world. And we have now Christianity throughout the world like never before. And so now we think about the, pro the, the, the persecution that they 
there and that they went through. Similar to these individuals that came over to the United States of America. They didn't have freedom of religion in England at that time. They had the Church of England. And they would make the edict from the king down to the religious leaders as to what you could say and what you could not say, what you could teach and what you could not teach. And you couldn't have an open Bible study and just preach the Word of God. No, it had to line up with what they had to say from the top down. And that's how corruption can happen within a church, as we know. And we recognize that even for the Israelites during the time of Jesus, they too had that kind of a rule of the authority of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they dictated what they could and could not do within the church. And then Jesus Christ came along and blew it all up and said, No, you're not doing it right, and this is not according to my Father. And the early church began. And so under times of persecution, it's amazing how we see the gospel message flourishing throughout the world. And unfortunately, how we also see in times of prosperity, like we're living in today, times to wane. Because people are more concerned about the material things. They're more concerned about their goods. They're more concerned about the gifts rather than the giver and the provider and the creator. And that's something we always have to keep in mind, especially in such times of prosperity as we are living in. Never, ever stop giving thanks to God. Never, ever stop thinking about Him because He has provided these things for us. But unfortunately, we think we provided for ourselves or the government provided for us or some charity provided for us or some other system provided for us. No, God has provided these things for us. And he's provided the freedoms within our nation for us. And he could take it away just as easily as he gave it to us. And so again, we have to realize in times of prosperity, let's actually live like the times of persecution and speak freely and boldly the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and continue to give thanks to him each and every day for all that he has provided. So as you know, again, we celebrate this Thanksgiving holiday. This is, as I said earlier, the 403rd year since those what we call pilgrims landed there in first Cape Cod and then coming down to Plymouth. And you have the Plymouth Rock down there. I don't think they really landed on that rock per se, but there's a good rock down there. I've seen it many times. And it says 1620 on it. And that's, again, a commemoration of when they landed. Okay, but they did land in that area and established a colony and and went through some horrific things in that first year, as you know, where about half of them perished. But yet those who remained continued on in their fervency for the Lord and giving thanks for the Lord and wanting to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ even to these lands. And these individuals who came over on that Mayflower, and again, if you've never been to the Mayflower, go to the Mayflower, okay? Go to the Mayflower and see how tiny it is. And then think about 102 people that were on that ship all at one time, along with whatever animals and food and provisions they needed. It would blow your mind away. You'd look at that boat and you'd say, eh, 10 or 20, that'd be comfortable, okay? 102? Are you kidding me? But as they came over, not all of them were religious uh, freedom seekers that we know as the pilgrims. About half of them were. The other half just wanted freedom, and the others were hired contractors to sail over here and to help establish the colony as well. But in any case, eventually they came to what is known as Plymouth, Massachusetts today. They settled there. In that Mayflower, as they came over, there was about 41 of those individuals that suffered persecution in England of freedom of religion. And as you know, they even went up to Amsterdam for a few years and found that they couldn't be free there as well. And uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, Uh, The sin that was overrunning their lives and the lives of their children as well was rampant. So again, they came back down from Amsterdam, back down to England, said, we can't do it here either. Because again, we can't be free in our religion, in our beliefs in the Lord. And so they ultimately they uh, contracted to sail a ship over here across the Atlantic Ocean, as you know, in probably one of the worst times that you could, you know, the fall is the worst time to sail. You ever know that? Isn't that hurricane season? It's like the worst time you could go across the Atlantic. And they thought that would be a good idea. (coughs) But you see, what they were doing was trusting in God and relying upon Him in all that they did. 
And so by September 6 in 1620, they set sail from Plymouth, England. And on November 11, 1620, 66 days at sea, they sighted land and anchored at what is now to, uh, known now as Provincetown on Cape Cod. The tip of Cape Cod is where they first landed. And again, think about that. 66 days, two months, two months at sea in the worst time of the year in September and uh, October, and then in, into November as well. Worst time of the year to be sailing. And they actually did come across one horrific storm uh, that was uh, all sunk the ship completely. And then they almost lost an individual, an individual overboard. But I know one guy, kid went over, but they got him back, so fortunate for him. But in any case, I digress. But originally, they were heading down to Virginia. And you see, back in the late 1500s, people had gone down to and you had the Roanoke settlement down there, and they disappeared. You had the Virginians, and, and people settled down there. And most of them died off in the very first few years as well. These individuals were heading but they ended up in Cape Cod and then coming over to Plymouth, as we know it today, Plymouth, Massachusetts. God had a different plan for them. They were going in one direction. Hey, let's go to Virginia. No, you're going up there. Because there's nobody else up there to corrupt you. There's nobody else there that's going to lead you astray. And oh, by the way, I've already got provisions ready for you when you land. And he did. And if you know the, the rest of the story about the land that was already there ready for them to uh, 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 plant and then reap uh, 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 fruits and vegetables from. If you know about Squanto and the whole story about him and captivity and slavery that he was under uh, back in the days in, uh, uh, I believe, in France and then coming up into England. He knew English well. And then he had escaped and come home. And then he was there to help these individuals through the first. They uh, had the winter. Again, think about England, too. They don't have winters the way we have winters, okay? It's always about 50 degrees in England, okay? Now they come over. They come over in November. They land in November, okay? And then you're in December, January, and February, the three worst months that you could be. And you can't grow anything. You can't plant anything. You can't do anything. And they were ill-prepared themselves, but yet God saw them through. And so as we uh, recognize, as they came over and ultimately landed on Cape Cod, first they came together and they put a contract together, which actually is the basis for the Constitution that we have today. And William Bradford, who became the governor of uh, the colony there in Plymouth, ultimately uh, uh, put it together and uh, with the other men that were with them. And here's how it reads. It says, in the name of God, amen. Don't you love that? In the name of God, amen. Right off the bat. In the name of God, amen. And what does amen mean? Yes, I believe it. And I'm, I'm uh, joining up in the same thought as you are. In the name of God. This is why we're doing this. In the name of God. It says, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of the dread. And again, different dread word back in the old days versus ours. The dread sovereign Lord, King James. By the grace of God of England, France and Ireland, King, defender of faith, and having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Yet they were far from Virginia, right? Do these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation, and furthermore of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, from time to time, as shall be uh, thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. With witness hereof, we have hereunto su uh, subscribed our names at Cape Cod on the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th um, of Scotland, the 54th, and then Anno Domini, which means in Latin, in the year of our Lord, 1621. 
Uh, first, they cut together. They put this constitution together. And then after that, they sent some men out in uh, shallow boats so that ultimately they could see the surrounding area and see if there was a, a better place to land. Because, again, if you've ever been to Provincetown, it's really just a spit of sand out there for planting and things like that. So they were looking for something a little better, something more that they could do, and maybe a place where they could dock the big ship called the Mayflower. And they did. And they found that harbor that we know as Plymouth Harbor today. Then they went back, told the rest, and then all of them came over. And so ultimately, on December 21st in 1620, the Mayflower landed in what is called Plymouth, Massachusetts, and the, uh, the pilgrims had reached their new home where they were going to establish their home. That's where they were going to plant their flag, as it were, and now begin a new colony. <coughs> Later on, William Bradford also wrote of a reason why they had this endeavor and why they embarked on such a journey, where he wrote a great hope in inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation, or at least to make some way here uh, thereunto, for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be but even stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. So they came over to do what? Proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I love that end, even if we're just stepping stones. And you all know the parable that our Lord gives us, you know, uh, some till the ground, some sow the seed, some water the seed, you know, uh, some, you know, I, I add to this all the time, but some fertilize it, okay? And then ultimately some harvest and then some reap, okay? So again, not all of us are going to do everything and we're not all going to see the end results. And they weren't concerned about necessarily them seeing the end results, but they wanted to plant the new seeds in this new world. And they just were fine with being a stepping stone for someone after them to come along and to continue the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now up in heaven, these individuals are looking down. Could you imagine how blown away they would be? Again, this is a little fantasy that I always have. Is like, wouldn't it be cool to take one of these pilgrims from back then and just, you know, maybe they didn't go to heaven and they can't see what earth is all about now and just transport them to our day 400 years later and take them through the city of Boston or something like that? How blown away would they be? And then show them the map of the United States of America and the vastness and the population and the churches and the Christianity that has flourished here as they were stepping stones for that. Forty people came over. Half of them died. Twenty people. Twenty people. That's all it took. But it flourished from there because they were faithful. And God used their first sowing of the seed and then multiplied it over and over and over again. And we have what we have today. Even as we sometimes have the declining of our nation, the declining of Christianity, there's still a ton of Christian beyond any other nation. It's mind-boggling how many people are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and gospel and follow the gospel and propagate that gospel these individuals would be blown away as we call it or as we've been talking about is the disciples were amazed when jesus christ was resurrected okay and how their minds were blown we see from the greek word same thing here same thing here but what great individuals. And think of the blessings that God is providing for these individuals in the eternal state for being that stepping stone. And he took those few individuals and look what he did. Look what he did. He took 12 apostles and look what he did. Okay? Again, you don't need an army to win the battle in the angelic conflict. You just need a good few faithful individuals who want to go forward for God and for Christ and for nothing else. Yes, we have lives to deal with and all the other thing, but the main focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of how God can use that in your own life. And think about what God will do with the seeds that you sow today, 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years from now. Think about what God will do with that. Again, if he could do it with these 20... And now we have millions 
What, what is he going to do with your seed as you sow it, as you deliver the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? So because of these individuals, again, uh, oh, I, I read this to you. I should have put it on the board, but I want to go to this one. And since then, and because, and in commemoration of what these you know, forefathers had done for us, these pilgrims that came across, as we call them today, again, starting with George Washington, and going down from president after president after president, there's always been some form of a day of thanksgiving for the nation for various reasons. And then as I've given you the history before, a beautiful woman by the name of Sarah Hale did some great work to establish a a one-day holiday within our nation where we would celebrate our Lord for what He has done for us. And Abraham Lincoln was the one that kind of codified the whole thing. And since then, and again, if you have the notes, you get the history of it. I won't go through all the detail. It kind of bounced around a little bit here and there. Okay? And then in the 1940s, it was solidified to be the third Thursday of the month of November as the day of uh, uh, recognition of our God and the divine provisions that he has given to us. And as George said, you know, when people, you go up to them and you ask them about Thanksgiving and they're thinking about turkey, okay? Well, you should just look back at them and say, you turkey. Did you do that today, George? Did you call those people turkey that you talked to? They were just thinking about turkey? No, just kidding. <laughs> if you're just thinking about turkey, you must be a turkey. Now, I date myself because I remember my father and one of his good friends back in the 70s used to use that as a slang to call somebody kind of an idiot. Okay, You turkey. Okay, Used to be a phrase. Not anymore. That's why you're not laughing. <coughs> but in any case... If you're just thinking about the turkey, if you're just thinking about the football game, if you're just thinking about the worldly material things, how worthless is that? And again, I love when I, I, I say this uh, uh, sarcastically, I love when people say, you know, give thanks. Because they never follow up with, to who? <laughs> you know, if you're going to give thanks, who are you giving thanks to? Always remember who that person is that you're thanking whether it be somebody that gives you a gift, or in this case, our God. So, thankful, and that's another term. Let's be thankful today. And now, thankful has become just a thing. No, it's a praise and it's a worship to our God. And that's what we have to keep in mind. And that's how we do to maintain a client nation unto God, by giving thanks to Him and saying, yes, you've provided these things for us. Thank you. I praise you. I honor you. I glorify you. I worship you. I thank you. And that's what we ought to do. He also said, not just this one day a year, but every day. Every day. But at least we do have this one day a year. Thank you for giving us one day, people. The nation, the United States. Thanks for at least one day. Okay. But again, we have that one day. And hopefully in this one day we have a collective coming together to give thanks to our God and to our Lord. And again, as Abraham Lincoln's richest gift of the Most High should be solemnly, reverently, and grace or gratefully acknowledged as heart and voice by the whole American people. And that's what it's all about. And that's what we should be doing. That's why we have this holiday that we have, to do just that. Patrick Henry, also one of our uh, founding uh, forefathers in 1776, says, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not a religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that reason alone, people of other faiths have been afforded freedom of worship here. Think about that. And again, we know what's going on with Israel and Palestine, and we see people from one side, we see people from the other side. They are afforded that freedom to proclaim whatever they want to proclaim, this side or that side, because of the Christian faith of freedom that has been afforded them because of the cost, the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the greatest giver of freedom. Not 
Israelites were looking freedom from the Roman Empire, not freedom from tyranny, not freedom from anything else, but freedom from sin and Satan and the victory over death. And because of that so great a freedom, if that is the greatest, that's kind of the a fortiori, if that's the greatest, we can do the less too. If Jesus Christ has given us the greatest freedom over our soul, over sin and over Satan, I guess we can afford freedom within our country to give people their own uh, uh, ability to choose for God or against God, for righteousness or for evil. Because we also know that evil will always, excuse me, that good and righteousness will always win. I almost said it backwards. Okay. <laughs> because we know that Jesus Christ has already won the victory. You see, there is not going to be a victory by evil or Satan. Absolutely not. The victory has already been won. And so we just walk in that victory each and every day and give thanks that the victory has been given to us through Jesus Christ. And so in regard to that, in all things, we honor God to the hilt. We give thanks to Him. And we give thanks to Him for the great men and women that He has raised up before us. Those stepping stones of the few people that came over on that wretched boat over hurricane season C. And then went through one of the worst winters ever recorded. And you're prepared. They didn't have homes and houses, you know. They lived on that boat. And then they'd build a hut here, somebody would move in. Build another hut, somebody would move in. Took them a long time. But we give thanks to God for their bra- for their courage. And bravery and courage comes from what? Their faith. Their trust in God. And following Him so that they too could freely worship and live unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, when we say live unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, we mean the Word of God. The entire Word of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we give thanks to Him for all that He has done as a result of uh, uh, through them, for them, and now for our entire nation over these last 400 years. And as we get into a few scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Again, you have a union with Christ. You are one with Christ. You're one with Christ. In everything, give thanks. Had pouring rain today. Did you thank God for the rain today? George, when you were out there delivering newspapers and getting soaking wet. Did you thank God for the rain today? Okay. My prayer is I thank God for the rain today. And I thank Him for the sunshine too. I thank Him for the good and for the bad that happens. In everything, thank God. Not that He brings all those, especially the bad. He doesn't bring the bad. That's Satan in this world. But again, I thank him for bringing that because it gives me an opportunity to develop my spiritual soul, my spiritual muscles to be stronger in Christ every day. So in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you. In the last book of the Bible, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. That's God, Jesus Christ. Again, here's a great passage that says Jesus Christ is God. Okay, plain and simple, people. Give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and has come, because you have taken our, your great power and you have reigned. Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 147. Psalm 147. And in verses uh, 7 through uh, 11 specifically, (coughs) in Psalm 147, 7, it says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre. So again, it's okay to play guitar in, in church, okay? Who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beasts its food. And to the young ravens which cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of men or of a man. 
The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. And again, not that God doesn't, you know, appreciate the strength of the horse and the strength of the legs of men. But in this case, those are analogies for the war horse and the warrior. And people uh, in the ancient days were getting too hung up on their military as being the victors to the exclusion of God. Yes, we do have a strong military, but we can only have a successful military when we are praising God first and foremost for that military and what he has provided. Because the horse and the legs of men do not win wars, God does. And when Israel was faithful to God, they would win their war. But when they trusted in themselves or the material things around them, they would be defeated. And the same goes in our life, in the little battles that we're in, in our little struggles every day. If we trust in self, we will be defeated. If we trust in God, we will be victorious. So with that, I'm not done yet. We've got some more things to do. But in the next section, we're going to celebrate communion. And I've got more verses that will go along with that communion supper that also give us understanding of the thanksgiving that we are to have each and every day. But with that, um, let's just say a, a little quick prayer right now in closing this section. Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you have done for our nation, the provisions that you have provided in the past, and what you continue to provide for us in the present. And Father, we just ask that you lead us to be more thankful each and every day as we glorify you for all that you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Spirit, not only in the spiritual realm, but in the physical material realm as well, so that you are glorified. And Father, we thank you for this time of service and collectively coming to We ask that you also be with the uh, next few portions of our service. In Christ's name, amen.